You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to The Corbett Report podcast. I'm your host, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, joining you on this 13th day of October 2017. Thank you for tuning in for episode 322 of The Corbett Report podcast, What is sustainable development? Now, hopefully, you have just completed episode 321 of this podcast, Why Big Oil Conquered the World, and before that, episode 310 on How Big Oil Conquered the World, so you are all caught up to date with the Big Oil series. If not, I suggest you go back and listen or re-listen to those podcasts so that you are caught up, because the next few podcasts are going to be fallout from that documentary project, which has been ongoing for a couple of years now, and uh, the end results of which are the three-hour How Big Oil and Why Big Oil Conquered the World documentary series. But obviously, with a project that is as vast as that, that spans as much topic matter as that, it's impossible to contain all of the information that you want to contain in a mere three hours, a mere three hours of exploration. And as you can imagine, there was a lot left out on the cutting room floor and a lot of things that are just mentioned in passing in the documentary that really do deserve podcast episodes unto themselves. So here I am to flesh out all of that top uh, topic data and go uh, in a little bit more detail through some of the things that I had to rush through in the production of those documentaries, and perhaps the number one glaring omission? Well, it wasn't an omission, it was a conscious act of leaving it out of the documentary because there was simply too much to go through, and there was no way to simply give a taste of this information in the documentary, but the number one thing you may have noticed that that isn't in there is Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, Sustainable Development. These are core linchpin parts of the connection between the big oil environmentalism, the carbon eugenics, and the technocracy. This is one of the links, the bridges, that bridges those uh, particular movements of the crypto eugenic ideology. And it's extremely important, which is why I was attempting to put it in here and there in the Why Big Oil Conquered the World documentary, but I realized there was no way to really force it in there and do it justice. Uh, It really does deserve its entirely own documentary, and perhaps that will come in the future. But for the time being, we'll use this podcast today to flesh out this concept, because as I say, it is linchpin, it is integral to understanding the bigger picture of the carbon eugenics technocratic push. Uh, of the modern-day uh, oligarchs and their their push for this system of total control, which may come as a surprise, because I'm sure you've never heard of sustainable development, at least in any mainstream sense, in anything but the most glowing and glorious terms. And yes, indeed, if you do have that question, what is sustainable development, you can always turn to that handy-dandy oracle of the modern era, YouTube. You can go and you can type in the search term, what is sustainable development? And it will guide you lovingly directly to the font of knowledge itself, the United Nations, so that you can behold this answer to your query. This September, 193 countries will meet at the UN to adopt new global goals. These 17 goals provide a roadmap that will help the world achieve sustainable development. But what exactly is sustainable development and how does it affect us? Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But what does that mean? Everyone understands the need to grow their economies, but not everyone takes into account the negatives that unbalanced economic growth can have on the environment and on people's well-being. It's time to change that by looking at the world in a different way. The Sustainable Development Goals will help us to do that. Sustainable development is about the big picture. It's about improving the lives of everyone, everywhere, and achieving all these things together. But it's also about the details. That means we want economies to grow, companies to thrive, and people to have decent work. We want to create new, innovative technologies, but not by harming the environment. We want everyone to have access to nutritious food regardless of where they live. 
We want affordable and quality education for everybody, not just a few. We want freedom of speech, but we don't want that to mean violence. But how can we achieve all of this and where do we even start? Well, the 17 goals will mean member states alongside civil society stakeholders and major groups will be working together for the next 15 years looking at ways we can do business differently so that everyone gains. With these 17 global goals as our guide, we can achieve sustainable development and live in a world where people and planet benefit. But we have to act now. This is the time for global action. To find out how you can get involved and learn more about the goals, go to www.un.org forward slash sustainable development. Precisely what target audience is this propagandistic twaddle aimed at? I refuse to believe that there's anyone, even people who are inclined to believe what is being said in this video, who believe that this video actually says anything of substance whatsoever. It is total propagandistic nonsense. It is meaningless babble for two minutes straight, set to a nice uplifting soundtrack and with images of beaming African children who are happy because the UN is there to save the day, and just a complete nothing burger of total meaningless vapid babble. If that did not satisfy your question about what is sustainable development, never fear, we will actually provide an answer in the, this podcast, but uh, that's just to set the stage to let you know what, what it is we're up against, which is a full-on propagandistic assault that is designed to make you feel like sustainable development it sounds like it's good, it sounds like it's manna from heaven, it sounds like it's something about good f being good for the environment and people are happy and everybody's sharing and all of these things that sound warm and fuzzy, so it must be a good thing. Hmm. Well, if you want to delve into this question in a little bit more detail and have a concise but meaningful answer, let's dig through the Corbett Report archives, because it was almost five years ago to the day, it was October 20th of 2012, that I broadcast Corbett Report Radio, episode 241. Again, that is available on the Corporate Report website. I will put the link in the show notes, so to take you directly there if you're so inclined. And in that uh, episode of Corporate Report Radio, I talked to Rosa Corey of Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.com, which is quite a mouthful. So again, I will link that URL directly in the show notes if you're interested in going there. She is the author of Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21, talking precisely about what at the time was known as Agenda 21 is now being pumped as Agenda 2030 and sustainable development. Well, perhaps we can start off for the benefit of the listeners out there who are encountering you for the first time or are unfamiliar with your work. Let's just hear a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in researching you in Agenda 21. Well, um, I'm a professional appraiser, a commercial appraiser. I was a district branch chief for the California Department of Transportation for about 30 years and an expert witness testifying in land use and land value. And uh, about 10 or so years ago, I found that it was pretty difficult to determine what property was worth because people were being restricted in what they could do with their property. And around that same time, I was elected to an oversight committee on a redevelopment project, a huge project, and I researched it and found that it was fraudulent. So uh, we sued to stop that. And while doing the research uh, to find out what was behind that redevelopment project, I found United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development. Well, let's talk about your book and how that came together and the type of research that you've done over the, uh, the pre preceding years into this agenda. The book is, um, basically, I wrote the book because I am traveling all over the United States and I just simply wasn't able to go everywhere. And I had the information and was able to put it together in a way that's very clear and understandable and it's a quick, short read. And, uh, and in that way, I was able to reach a lot more people because uh, United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development is a global plan, but it's implemented locally. So this is really important because it, it doesn't come called Agenda 21. So you have to know what it looks like in your town to be able to recognize it. Well, that's right. In fact, every time we have someone on to talk about Agenda 21, it's uh, everyone has their own way of summing up what that is and, and how it's unfolding. So, so what's your take on what is United Nations Agenda 21? 
Agenda 21 is the action plan. It's the blueprint to inventory and control all land, all water, all plants, all minerals, all animals, all construction, all means of production, all information, all energy, all education, and all human beings in the world. That's it. It's totally comprehensive. It's so comprehensive. It goes into so many different aspects of everyone's everyday life that it's staggering to think that so few people actually know, have even heard of this Agenda 21, let alone know what it is. How can it function so that it maintains that level of secrecy while being completely out in the open? Yeah, it's brilliant. It's a stealth plan and it's operating in plain sight. And that is because it's called by so many different names. Uh, you'll see it in your town as a regional plan, generally as a, a one Bay Area or Vision 2025 or Our Future 2050, something like that. Uh, because what it is, uh, the plan was signed onto, it's a, it was an actual United Nations agreement signed onto in 1992 by our president, George H.W. Bush, along with 178 other national leaders. And you're going to hear that it's an old, dusty plan, that it has, it's not binding, that it has no impact on you. That's a lie. Uh, the truth is that it was uh, brought back to the United States through the President's Council on Sustainable Development back in 1993. And all federal agencies changed their policies to conform with United Nations Agenda 21 on Sustainable Development. That's right. Well, let's let's go back to some of the beginnings of this, because as you indicate, it was uh, first signed uh, as an agreement in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, but it has its roots in policies that go back as at least to the 1970s. So let's talk a little bit about the history of these ideas of sustainable development and how they came together. Yeah, it's great. You know, it's the kind of thing that you could you think to yourself, well, how could I be against sustainability? It just sounds so great. I mean, what do you you know, who wants to be unsustainable? Um, and of course, that term sustainable development is a term that comes right out of the United Nations 1987, the Bretland Commission, World Commission on Environment and Development. And they wrote uh, a book called Our Common Future. And in that, the term sustainable development was first, uh, you know, first coined, you know, formally given a definition. And that is, um, De uh, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Sounds great, right? But uh, this has its roots in um, prior meetings of the United Nations in 1972 and then again in 1976, the uh, Habitat 1 and 2 determined that um, land, privately owned land, is actually a threat to the equity social equity of people on the planet. And this is a very vital part of the United Nations Agenda 21 because it actually is an attack on private property ownership. And also, you have to remember that we ourselves are our own most important private property. And this plan actually enables uh, domestic surveillance, the National Defense Authorization Act, drones, and control of all of our activities on the planet. Once again, Rosa Corey, author of Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21. And I hope that that gives a sense of the real agenda behind Agenda 21, not the warm and fuzzy feel-good rhetoric of the United Nations propaganda ads, but the real agenda about using people's natural concern for their fellow human beings and the state of the environment and using that concern as a way to further an agenda of centralization and control. And in case it wasn't clear enough from that interview, you can turn to Behind the Green Mask, where you can read, uh, uh, again, in very simple, plain language, Rosa Corey's uh, definition of what this agenda is. She says, in a nutshell, the plan calls for governments to take control of all land use and not leave any of the decision making in the hands of private property owners. It is assumed that people are not good stewards of their land and the government will do a better job if it is in control. Individual rights in general are to give way to the needs of communities as determined by a globalist governing body. Moreover, people should be rounded up off of the land and packed into human settlements or islands of human habitation, as they are called in the UN Agenda 21 documents, close to employment centers and transportation. Another program 
called the Wildlands Project, spells out how most of the land is to be set aside for non-humans. In anticipation of our objections to such plans, our civil rights will be dissolved. End quote. Well, it doesn't get much starker than that, and that is the base underlying part of this agenda through which we have to understand it. Again, this is not about, oh, we feel bad for the, the poor animals, so we're going to confiscate this land from all you uh, horrible, mean people and wisely steward over it. It is about taking that land away from the people, herding them into uh, cattle-like, into human habitation corridors and areas where the people are allowed to live, and taking the rest of the planet and monopolizing the use of those resources for people in the clique, the people who are in these global governing bodies that determine what happens with this non-usable land. Non-usable for you and me, usable for the usual connected cronies uh, that are always swirling around the toilet bowl of these global governmental organizations. And she goes on in much greater detail throughout the book. Again, I hope you'll uh, get a copy and read it. But she goes on, for example, uh, talking about how immediately after uh, Bush, President then President Bush, signed on to UN Agenda 21 in the wake of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, uh, he founded the President's Council on Sustainable Development, populated by the likes of people like, oh, you know, Ken Lay of Enron. Yes, because Ken Lay really cared about the Earth and really wanted to make sure that we could protect these natural species. And no, of course not. These people are in it for the monopolization of the world's resources. This is the key to understanding this. So in order to flesh this out in a little bit more detail, where did this agenda come from and who was behind it? Let's turn to Patrick Wood, of course, the author of Technocracy Rising, who was one of the featured speakers in the Why Big Oil Conquered the World documentary. And there was a lot more that I recorded with Patrick Wood in our conversation that didn't make it into the documentary. So here's a little bit where Patrick Wood expands a little bit on UN Agenda 21 and its real roots. Who were the real players who were instrumental in forming this agenda? Agenda 21 was spawned in 1992 at the first Earth Summit that was held in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the chairman of that Earth Summit was Maurice Strong, uh, an important name uh, in this whole movement. The Agenda 21 document was a 40 chapter book that was produced uh, by the United Nations, uh, produced it was published after that conference was ended. That was the agenda for the 21st century. That's why it was called Agenda 21. 21 stood for the 21st century. That was in 1992, and they figured that they had eight years to get a run-up running start at it uh, to actually start implementing stuff by the year 2000. And this would kind of be the, the agenda for that period of time. However, to get some perspective on what was really going on. This was not a UN, this was not something that just popped out of the UN, like, you know, some kind of uh, spontaneous evolution or something, not at all. Uh, the United Nations themselves give credit for Agenda 21 to a commission that it had implemented back in 1983, terminated in 1987, that was called the Bruntland Commission, uh, after the, the, the head of it, Gro Harlem Bruntland. And um, uh, they challenged Bruntland to form this commission to talk about, you know, to develop the economic policies and so on that, that, uh, that they wanted to see. Well, it so happened that that, that Gru Brotland was a member of the Trilateral Commission. This is not surprising. This is how Rockefeller was able to get stuff done. Uh, so Gru Brotland was the lady, the woman that wrote Our Common Future, the book, that the United Nations later gave accolades to as saying Agenda 21 would not have been possible without Our Common Future, the book. It was produced in 1987. That was also the book that first popularized the term sustainable development. Uh, it had been coined before that, but uh, but Brentland gave it 
a proper noun status where, you know, like capital S and capital D. Um, and she defined it as an economic system. It basically, I, I've always contended now, it's technocracy from the 1930s. But she penned this document not for the sake of the United Nations and not for the sake of the people of the world. She penned this document for the benefit of the Trilateral Commission. There's just absolutely no doubt about that. And uh, so there's Agenda 21, pops out in 1992, and all sorts of things happened since then, including Agenda 2030, which was just passed a couple of, last year. And uh, that was a, like an update to Agenda 21, if you will, gave it a little bit more teeth. But um, Agenda 21 was, was not the benevolent uh, world consensus document that people think it is. It was a very narrow policy statement that was created by policy walks at the Trilateral Commission for the sake of creating a new international economic order, which was or is technocracy. And that's where this whole thing is leading. It's exactly what sustainable development is. It's um, it's, it's absolutely it's an incredible story, James. It just you look at it and say, how can this be? How could this just slip by and nobody caught it? Well, somebody caught it. Sud and I caught it a little bit back in the seventies, and I'm, we're catching it today. We can see what they've done now, but nobody understood it at the time. So we've had the big overview of what this agenda is, and now we're narrowing down on some of the, the core documents and details about the who, what, where, when, why. So let's turn to some of those core documents that Patrick Wood was mentioning there. Firstly, where did this come from? Where did sustainable development, capital S, capital D, as a concept really emerge from? Well, it's been around since the 1970s, but it was really formalized as... Patrick Wood pointed out there, by the Brundtland Commission, more formally known as the United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development, chaired by Gru Harlem Brundtland, and one of the members on that commission, no surprise to anyone in the audience uh, who's been paying attention to my work on these issues, of course, was Maurice Strong. But uh, the uh, that commission, of course, did come out with its final report in 1987 called Our Common Future, and we don't have to speculate about what was in that report. You can turn to undocuments.net, un-documents.net, where you can read the report itself. And specifically, Section 3 is headlined Sustainable Development. And this was the formalization and the the, uh, the, the codification of our modern understanding of this term. So let's read a little bit from this document, uh, section 3-27. Humanity has the ability to make development sustainable to ensure that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The concept of sustainable development does imply limits. Not absolute limits, but limitations imposed by the present state of technology and social organization on environmental resources and by the ability of the biosphere to absorb the effects of human activities, etc., etc. Um, I think we know that type of rhetoric and where it goes. Uh, uh, section 29 talks about sustainable global development requires that those who are more affluent adopt lifestyles within the planet's ecological means in their use of energy, for example. Further, rapidly growing populations can increase the pressure on resources and slow any rise in living standards. Thus, sustainable development can only be pursued if population size and growth are in harmony with the changing productive potential of the ecosystem. And section 30, yet in the end, sustainable development is not a fixed state of harmony, but rather a process of change in which the exploitation of resources, the direction of investments, the orientation of technological development and institutional change are made consistent with future as well as present needs. We do not pretend that the process is easy or straightforward. Painful choices have to be made. Thus, in the final analysis, sustainable development must rest on political will." End quote. 
So that was that set the tone, certainly, for the conversation that was to come and was to be further fleshed out at Maurice Strong's next major coup de grace, the, uh, the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, where a number of different agenda items were ticked off, a lot of different boxes uh, checkmarked during that conference, one of which was UN Agenda 21, which did come out as uh, part of that agenda, that Rio Earth Summit. And as Patrick Wood mentioned, it came out in the form of a 39-chapter book, this document that is published by the United Nations. You can purchase it. You can read through it. Uh, there's even a Kindle version, if that's your thing. Uh, so you can go and read through the actual UN Agenda 21 document, and if you're inclined, go ahead and do so. Uh, I will warn you that it is the most banal, boring, legalistic gibberese that makes your eyes gla glaze over, and certainly doesn't include any... Uh, smoking gun, here we are to rule the world, ha ha ha, type of lines. But it is, of course, that is manifest in absolutely every part of this agenda. The implicit assumption that human beings certainly cannot be left to their own devices to manage the earth. They must be ruled over by global international order, organizations of various sorts that will come in and sort this out for the little people. So it's all, it follows a format where every, it's divided into different chapters on different parts of the eco, ecological sphere, talking about agriculture, talking about uh, mountainous regions, talking about uh, fish and wildlife, talking about waterways and these types of things. And in each, uh, each section, it goes through the, the goals and objectives and activities that they're arguing for and how they're going to be funded and all of this kind of thing. And uh, you can read through it and you can see, for example, chapter two about international cooperation, talking quite heavily about the need for, at that time, GATT, the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trades, which of course became the World Trade Organization, and how vital it was to orient GATT towards these international sustainable development treaties that they were trying to hardwire into the international law at that time. And uh, of course, part of that is using the trade liberalization, uh, globalization, as we have come to know it of the past 20 years, uh, as a key tool for uh, facilitating the type of trade that would be necessary to underlie this sustainable development uh, agenda. So globalization, absolutely a core part of this. Chapter four on changing consumption patterns, where they note the technocratic wet dream of expanding and promoting databases on production and consumption, first in each individual country, and then of course that would be aggregated in an international database so that the technocrats could get their hands on all of the information about everything that's happening in all of these different economies so that they could socially engineer people to be more sustainable and harmonious and balanced and dictate exactly what you can do and what you can't do and how much meat you can eat today and how much how far you are allowed to drive if you're allowed to drive at all and all of that stuff but of course they don't explicitly mention that level of control but that's what this is all about uh, chapter five demographic dynamics and development talking about the full integration of population concerns, population concerns, international planning policy and decision-making processes, of course. Uh, chapter eight, integrating environment and development, where they talk about the enactment and enforcement of laws and regulations essential for the implementation of most international agreements in the field of environment and development. Also talking about how each country should develop integrated strategies to maximize compliance with its laws and regulations relating to sustainable development. Why would you even need to say that? Why would you need to stress that each country must maximize compliance with its laws? It's vaguely threatening. Chapter 33, financial resources, talking about the big question, how are you going to fund all of this? Well, there are a couple of interesting answers, one of which is the Global Environment Facility, which should ring a bell if you paid close attention to why Big Oil Conquered the World. It was mentioned in there. Uh, the World Conservation Bank that Edmund Rothschild rolled out, or the idea that he was pimping at the 1987 World uh, Fourth World Wilderness Conference, helmed by Maurice Strong, of course, uh, that came to fruition in 1992 uh, after the Earth Summit as the Global Environment Facility, mentioned in the Agenda 21 document, uh, saying the Global Environment Facility, managed jointly by the World Bank, the UN Development Program, and the UN Environment Program, whose additional grant and concession funding is designed to achieve global environmental benefits, should cover the agreed interim incremental costs of relevant activities under Agenda 21. And what are those costs? Well, they're enumerated later on in Chapter 33 of the Agenda 21 document. The Secretariat of the Conference has estimated that average annual costs 
1993 to 2000 of implementing this agenda would be over $600 billion. Keep in mind that is average annual costs that they were envisioning for the implementation of this agenda. Over $600 billion per year. And that was 1990s dollars, where hundreds of billions was a huge, mind-bogglingly huge figure. Not so much in these days where we throw around trillions like they're uh, sticks of bubblegum. Um, but yeah, that gives you a sense of the scope of this agenda, or at least what they were intending for this agenda. And then in chapter 39, International Legal Instruments, they talk about the further development of international law on sustainable development, giving special attention to the delicate balance between environmental and developmental concerns. Now, again, there's no smoking gun where they're talking about ruling over the peons or anything like that. But as I say, this is embedded in the very concept of Agenda 21 itself, and of course in its implementation through things like the President's Council on Sustainable Development, uh, which uh, Rosa Corey writes about in her book, talking about people like Ken Lay and others are going to be the ones determining how do we balance environmental concerns with development concerns. And of course, it will be the exact same formula that the oligarchs use to create their monopoly on the energy supply of the 20th century. It is to rule out the possibility of any competition because as John D. Rockefeller sagely uh, advised us, competition is a sin. That is, if you're trying to compete with the, the big boys, the oligarchs and their minions, then you are a sinner and you need to be expelled. So how do you do that? Well, you create these wildlife corridors and these preservation areas that can be developed. We can use the, we can, we have to balance environment and development. It just means that you have to go through these international bodies and these organizations that have somehow or other gained control of these areas and if you have the right development project and ideas and you have the, the you, you do your due diligence and you you and you have the secret handshake and you went to the right you know, secret society and the right university then you can absolutely go ahead with your development i.e exclude all competition and make sure only the cronies will have access to these resources this is the fundamental part that we have to understand about the sustainable development agenda. It is about carving out monopolized spaces of the planet, monopolizing those resources for the sole and only use of the connected clique members who are part of the special club who get to participate in the development projects that are allowed to happen there. Everyone else will be moved into these little human habitation areas where we'll be crammed in and everything will be monitored, controlled, and eventually rationed as the uh, as we enter neo-feudalism. Uh, again, this is such, such a vast idea, such a vast agenda that it is hard for most people to get their hands around on it, uh, to get their mind around it. And so let's listen to another part of my interview with Patrick Wood where I think he details quite succinctly and quite powerfully what this agenda is and how it is going to function. What's happening is that there is a massive resource grab going on all over the planet. And when I say resource grab, <clears throat> you have to put yourself in Rockefeller's shoes and the banker's shoes, the Rothschild shoes and whatever, and say, what do you do when money wears out? What do you do when you sucked all the value you can out of the monetary systems you created, what's left? <laughs> well, it's, you and I don't think about those sort of things. We don't have that much money, but these people at the top, the, especially the bankers, they, they, I'm sure they stay up at night thinking, what's, what's after money? What comes after money? The Rockefeller family, especially, has always been a resource intensive family. That's what oil was all about in the first place. It was a resource and they understood that energy would be the most important factor in the world over any other type of resource. They understood that. That's why they wanted to create a monopoly over energy. <clears throat> well, today as money has been sucked dry the only thing left to do is to make a grab for the resources themselves. And that's what sustainable development is all about. 
is taking the resources of the world away from you and me, away from private companies that aren't part of the clique, if you will, and putting them into a global common trust that will be managed by them for their benefit. This is really nothing more than neo-feudalism, again, where the resources are owned by a few and everybody else gets to operate with those resources at their pleasure and discretion. But we see this resource grab not only in America, but all over the planet. Uh, and they've had different schemes that they've implemented along the way to do it. In America, for instance, uh, you have the federal government gobbling up blocks of land around America, putting them into various kinds of conservation trusts or national monuments or whatever, but basically taking the land away from the states so the states can't develop that property. They can't collect taxes on it because the government doesn't pay taxes. And so now you have a massive amount of property owned in the United States by, by the federal government. So, well, that's really strange because the Constitution doesn't provide anything for that. In fact, it says they're not supposed to own any land except for D.C. and a few ports and stuff around the country and something for the military. So it's completely outside of our Constitution. They're doing it anyway. But now <clears throat> the United Nations has implemented a program, for instance, called uh, Debt for Land where they're going around to countries that have been buried in debt, on purpose, I might add, but they've been buried in debt. They have no way they can ever pay off. And they say, look, here's what we'll do. If you, um, if you agree to put X millions of acres into a conservation trust, a wilderness area, conservation trust, whatever, uh, we will waive the interest on your loans, basically forgive your loans, but that interest that you would have paid to us, you have to pay to maintain those wilderness areas, you know, those, those conservation areas. So once that land is taken out of production, it can't serve the people of the world anymore. It's a resource grab. And they're doing this all over the planet. It's absolutely astounding when you see the hundreds and hundreds of millions of acres that these people have taken offline. And some of your viewers might remember the movie Goldfinger, the first one of the first uh, uh, James Bond movies. The, the theory of Goldfinger was he was going to uh, he was going to raid Fort Knox. And the idea was he wasn't going to steal the gold. He was going to set off a nuclear device so that it would irradiate the gold that was there. And all the other gold that he'd already bought up in the world would instantly be worth billions of dollars. It was a genius plan. Just just spoil spoil the the gold that's in Fort Knox, and you'll you'll have all the you know all the wealth that you want. Well, this is kind of what's happening with the resources of the world today. Take them out of the pool, take them out of production, and obviously that makes any remaining land even more valuable. Because land is where we get everything. That's where all the wealth of the world comes from, whether you're, whether it's timber, agriculture, water, uh, gold, minerals, metals, you know, all the kind, everything we have is from the earth, everything. And they're seeking to control all the resources of the earth. And they're doing it through the auspices of the United Nations and sustainable development. It's a resource grab on a global scale. And it is about monopolization of the world's resources for the benefit of a very few at the expense of humanity. Now, again, this is such a vast thing to wrap our minds around that it can be difficult to even comprehend. But let's dig into some of the details about what this means and how it is actually functioning to try to get a handle on what is going on here. And to do so, let's dig up some details about that mechanism, that body, that World Conservation Bank that we talked about, that we mentioned earlier as part of being specifically mentioned in Agenda 21 and is coming out of the Earth, the Rio Earth Summit, although being propounded by Maurice, uh, sorry, Edmund de Rothschild back in 1987 and others before him, but the Global Environmental Facility, um, which again, you will not have heard of if you uh, just 
read the the sort of headlines about sustainable development, but is an exceptionally important body that exists and is doing real things in the real world. If you want more information about the Global Environment Facility and what it does, I would highly recommend, not to toot my own horn, but I did write an article about this last year called The Second Most Important Bank You've Never Heard Of. And it goes through a number of the different programs. It goes through that story about Edmund Rothschild and how that led to the, the Rio Earth Summit and the creation of the GEF. But for the summary of what this body does and how it does it, let's read from that article where I wrote, The Global Environment Facility has so far made over $14.5 billion in grants and co-financed a further $75.4 billion. It is the funding mechanism for five different UN conventions, including the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which itself established the IPCC. The bank's slick promotional videos highlight a number of projects it has helped fund in various impoverished nations. The construction of drainage trenches to prevent glacial lake flooding in Bhutan, the establishment of protected areas and economic development in Mali's wildlife areas, and the funding of Chinese companies producing solar cells and wind farm technology. Supremely bizarre group chanting videos aside... We are the Global Environment Facility. And we're chanting for sustainability. Me. The whole operation sounds pure as the driven snow, right? Not so fast. According to the GEF's website, the facility was established on the eve of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit to help tackle our planet's most pressing environmental problems. It has 18 implementing partners, including the Rockefeller-funded Food and Agricultural Organization, the Foundation-funded and corporate-friendly International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the Maurice Strong-created United Nations Environment Program, and the Prince Bernard Prince Philip-founded World Wildlife Fund. If such a pedigree immediately casts doubt on the altruistic intentions of the bank, one is right to be skeptical. In reality, the GEF and its affiliated environmental finance organizations have an ulterior motive. Using the debt chain sown by the World Bank and IMF on impoverished third world nations as leverage to gain control over vast swaths of these countries' lands and resources, and funnel money to the money to the banksters' corporate cronies. Sound far fetched? The practice is fully admitted to, well documented, and even has a catchy name Debt for Nature Swaps. The GEF's own documents describe debt for nature swaps this way. Debt for nature swaps are voluntary transactions in which a portion of a developing country's hard currency debt is cancelled or reduced by a creditor. In exchange, the debtor agrees to allocate a portion of its cancelled debt in local currency to environmental programs or projects. Initially, most, most were private swaps in which international environmental NGOs raised the funds and initiated the process. In recent years, many swaps have been bilateral, where both the creditor and debtor are governments. Other creditors can include commercial banks or commercial firms owed money by governments or developing countries. An interesting aside. Although it is generally touted as a win-win for debtor nations, with debt relief for the debtor and environmental protections that, that benefit the globe, the debt for nature scheme always comes with strings attached. The seeding of certain land for environmental development, for example, or the imposition of certain regulations and restrictions on a country's existing industries. As the Convention on Biological Diversity admits, the scheme usually comes with hefty transaction costs of between 1.5 and 5% of the face value of the debt itself. And the big winners of these projects are generally the ones contracted to do them, manage them, or direct the investments, not the locals who, like the aborigines of Palawan Island, are kicked off their land and effectively wiped off the face of the map. Although it sounds scarcely believable, the debt for nature swap proposal has been kicking around since it was first suggested by Thomas Lovejoy of the World Wildlife Fund in 1984. It was first used in Bolivia in 1987, and by 1991, the Journal of the American Bar Association, the international lawyer, was publishing articles about the concept. By 1998, it had been hardwired into U.S. law through the Tropical Forest Conservation Act, which has so far facilitated $223 million in debt for nature deals with 14 different countries. End quote. Some interesting little nuggets in there, aren't there? And I would hope, I did mention this also in the Why Big Oil documentary, uh, the Aborigines of Palawan Island is one example of the victims of these kinds of schemes, but there are many, many more, and I hope you followed the link from that 
uh, mention of the Palawan Island Aborigines in the Why Big Oil Conquered the World documentary transcript, where you will find a uh, link to eco-action.org talking about worldwide fraud, uh, talking about the WWF specifically, and its association with many, many examples of indigenous peoples being run out of their their tribal native lands where they've lived their in, their entire existence for the benefit of environmental development projects overseen and driven by the WWF and its cronies. And remember who founded the WWF, Prince Bernard and Prince Philip and uh, Julian Huxley and Godfrey Rockefeller, um, another member of a different branch of the Rockefeller family. So there you go. Very Interesting, isn't it? And so if you follow that uh, that link to worldwide fraud, you'll find many, many examples of these these types of situations where people are driven from their lands in the name of environmental development. In Zaire, the Barwa Pygmies were driven out of their ancestral land in order to establish the Kahuzi Biega National Park. WWF has been deeply involved. The victims formerly lived in dignity in their traditional ways, but are now exposed to alcoholism, prostitution, extreme poverty, and exploitation by the neighboring Bantu people. Likewise, uh, Bambuti pygmies were driven out of the Maiko National Park as a result of joint government and WWF activities. Similarly, in Central Africa, the Zanga Sanga project, which had been directed by WWF since 1988, has resulted in the destruction of livelihood and loss of digni dignity of the Baka pygmies in this area and in the loss of their ancestral homeland. In Rwanda, the Batwa pygmies were driven out by the Nyungwi Natural Forest in 1994 to make way for a nature conservation site. WWF was involved in the creation of this area, and as a result, the, ba the Batwa of Rwanda have lost their ancestral land and last refuge. In Kenya, the Tsavo East National Park has been established and is managed by, with the help of WWF on the Sanyi ancestral land. The Sanyi have been severely prosecuted as poachers on their own land. As a result, the Sanyi peoples have been virtually destroyed as a society of hunters and gatherers. In Namibia, the Hayom Bushmen have been driven out of their ancestral land, the Atosha Pan, which WWF is involved in securing as a conservation area. In consultation with WWF, the government of Botswana declared at the Zani Kotla meeting in February 1996 that the 3,000 last remaining Bushmen in broadly traditional hunting and gathering lifestyles have to leave their ancestral land and their traditional lives. The reason being that their ancestral land is now proposed as a new game reserve. In South Africa, the 40 last remaining Bushmen have been chased out of their ancestral land, which is now uh, largely used as the Kalahari Gemsbok National Park. WWF has been involved and is still involved. Furthermore, they continue to discount the land claims of the evacu evacuated Bushmen. In India, the Gujar no nomads in Uttar Pradesh are victims of a na nature conservation project, where WWF is directly involved. Also, the last few Aborigine peoples belonging to the Negrito race have been victimized by national park projects in the Nil Nilgiri Mountains, where WWF was and still is active. Etc. Etc. I think you get the idea. Please do go read through that article and look at the examples of how this has already been used time and time again as an excuse for driving people out of their lands and taking those lands over in the name of preserving nature and doing some development deals on the side with transaction costs being funneled by commercial banks. Wonderful gig if you can get it, right? And uh, don't think that this is some sort of ancient history or something that's been stopped in the uh, recent past, because it still continues to go on to this day. Deserted and destroyed, these ruins in western Uganda are all that remains of a rural village the residents allegedly evicted to make way for a timber plantation. For Bowman Elifazi, the memory is too much. He says his community was forced out at gunpoint by police and private security operatives and that he lost everything. They cut down all our crops and burned our houses or destroyed them with bulldozers. People were scared of the guns, so they ran away and hid. They took everything we had. The land clearances, starting in 2006, were to make way for the new forest company, a British company with World Bank financing and UN accreditation to trade carbon credits. Despite a massive investment in Uganda that's meant to bring jobs and sustainable growth, international charity Oxfam 
claims the company is responsible for abusing the rights of over 20,000 former occupants. Many of them now live nearby in extreme poverty. They say they've got no land to farm and they want compensation. The company claims the eviction was the government's responsibility. The government claims the occupants were there illegally. The people that were living on this land, which is now a tree plantation, took their case to the Uganda High Court in 2009. The court made an interim ruling saying the evictions should be halted, but they were evicted anyway. Now they say they're too destitute to be able to afford the lawyers to pursue their case. The areas in question are meant to be protected forest reserves, but thousands of people have been living and farming there for decades. It remains unclear if that's sufficient to grant ownership rights on the Ugandan law. Land issues in Uganda are quite very complex because there are multiple rights on the same piece of land. So uh, an investor must take, uh, be proactive to understand what kind of land am I going to invest in. However, Oxfam claims the new forest company are obliged by international regulations to change their practice regardless of local law. For those who lost the land they depended on, sustainable tree plantations turned out to be their worst nightmare. Malcolm Webb, Al Jazeera, in Western Uganda. Well, joining us from London now, we have Kate Geary, the co-author of the Oxfam Report, and Robert Devereux, the chairman of the New Forests Company. Thank you both for joining me. Robert, let me start with you, because it's a pretty damning report by uh, Oxfam. It, it, Oxfam saying your company has abused the rights of over 20,000 occupants. Can you categorically deny that? Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, I think I can categorically deny it. But what I would like to say is that we are taking these allegations extremely seriously. Um, we're, ex we're puzzled by them because they completely contradict our understanding of how these movements took place. Uh, and that's an understanding that has been validated in a number of independent reports that took place subsequently to them. Um, there are a number of factual inaccuracies about this, but rather than talking at length, perhaps I could uh, um, let Kate have... Well, let me say. just ask you this. Witnesses are saying that your company security guards were present at many of the evictions. And at the end of the day, I mean, your company claims to be socially responsible. And many of these people are now living in abject poverty. Well, I mean, we are an extremely socially responsible company and we have a reputation for that. And that's a reputation that's thoroughly deserved. Um, the, 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 the first thing I think I should say is that it must be understood that these, we are not by... Ugandan law allowed to participate in land claims, evictions, evacuations or vacations. What our responsibility is is to try and ensure to the best of our ability that they take place humanely and in respect of people's rights. Uh, I believe we did that uh, and this is why I find these stories so confusing because we believe these movements to have taken place voluntarily and peacefully. Um, I could give you lots of anecdotes for example that we allowed um, a significant number of people back onto the land after they had left uh, to cultivate their crops. They came on and they left again quite peacefully. None of that seems to correspond in any okay. way to the well, horrific stories. And let, they are horrific stories that Kate, are coming out of the Oxfam report. Let's bring in Kate to answer that on, on behalf of Oxfam. Kate, uh, Robert's saying that, to, that to the evictions or, or people's movements uh, were undertaken in, in a hu humane way. And in any case, a lot of those people were there illegally, weren't they? I'm, I too am quite mystified by, by how Robert can be saying that people left their land voluntarily. Um, these are people who have brought two court cases against the company, alleging that uh, they, were, they were abused and harassed, that their crops were destroyed and their homes destroyed. So but the company it wasn't is aware the company, the, that, it wasn't that the company doing it, Kate. It, it was the government, the Ugandan government carried out these uh, evictions and the Ugandan government is saying that they were there illegally. The Ugandan government also bears some responsibility here, but it, the responsibility also lies with the company. It simply cannot duck responsibility for what has happened to the people who were on that land. They were evicted forcibly to make way for this company's plantations. It's not enough for the company to blame the government and to wash its hands of this problem. No. Uh, Robert, we, I, we can, can I ask you? Um, that, that, significant Kate, let me put that point to Robert. Can because I respond to that? Your, your company is making a lot of money out of this. Uh, d d will it consider uh, compensation or the wider welfare of these people? Well, can I make a number of this? I mean, first of all, we're not actually making a lot of money out of that, but that's a separate point. We offered. Um, on a, on a spe particular specific answer to the compensation issue, we offered um, to pay compensation. The government 
uh, were unwilling to, t to, make, to, to take advantage of that proposal. Uh, we're not a land under Ugandan law to pay uh, compensation. And I want to say, to be very clear, we are not ducking responsibility for these issues. We've, ta we've gone to great lengths to try and ensure that these movements were undertaken voluntarily and peacefully. And not only is it our opinion that they were, but a Forestry Stewardship Council audit that took place after the movements not only said that they were done humanely and fairly, but actually proposed using the processes as a model for future movements of this kind. Um, we're not going to duck our responsibilities. We're going to take these allegations seriously. We're going to follow up on them. Uh, and if we find any truth on them, in them, we will take appropriate action. OK, last quick word to Kate, because, I mean, land issues are notoriously complex, aren't they? Uh, what is clear is that companies like NFC have brought massive investment into Uganda. I mean, that's a good thing, isn't it? Oxfam welcomes investment when it's responsible. And indeed, um, NFC has carried out community development. But we also see the downside of the investment where 22,000 people were forced from their land and are now left in destitution. We welcome the fact that the company is going to look into that. The, com the communities are demanding justice. They would like to be compensated and given alternative land so that they can restore their livelihoods. OK, let me thank both my guests. By the way, I very quickly, Robert. So I was just going to say, I think we... OK, thank you very much. <laughs> OK, Robert, thank, thank you, you very much indeed for that. And, uh, and Kate Geary, in, uh, both of our guests in London there. Now, of course, this is all going to be done with a wink and a nod to the old boys in the old boys network that, yeah, well, these are just some bushmen out in the middle of nowhere. Who cares? Kick a few dozen tribesmen off their land and we'll, we'll take over the land and use those resources properly. It's, it's for the best. And who cares? It's in the backwoods of darkest Africa. Uh, what, what does it matter? Well, don't worry, old boys. This network is coming for you and your land, too. Of course, this is not limited to any particular area of the globe. It is a global agenda, and it is being implemented globally everywhere, including the United States of America, where you may have seen the map before uh, about the Wildlands Project, showing the different corridors of wildlife and conservation areas and uh, areas, the no-go zones, basically, where if the Wildlands Project and other such things are implemented, humans will not be able to go without special permission from the uh, overarching international governmental bodies that will be overseeing these types of things. And it's an interesting map, but where does it come from? What is the Wildlands Project? What is this all about? Well, you can go uh, to, for example, uh, nwri.org, where you can find the Wildlands pro uh, background on the Wildlands Project, which has a pretty thorough overview uh, of what this is, where it came from, going tracing it back to the 1976 UN Conference on Human Settlements, and then through the uh, Brundtland Commission, and then through Agenda 21, and then finally into the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was uh, signed there in the 1990s, and how this is essentially a project to create these corridors and areas that, again, will not be usable um, by you know, humans without the special pass from the government, i.e. without Kenley or his his ilk giving you the permission, or more likely giving his friends the permission to develop this or that. Um, and it goes through in this article in great detail about all of those things. Uh, so I, I will suggest that uh, to you, and I'll put the link in the show notes, of course. The Wildlands Project has morphed into the Wildlands Network, which is available at wildlandsnetwork.org. So you can go and read through their propaganda material, and they even provide the, the various uh, source documents that uh, that first documented this idea and its proposal and development in the Wild Earth uh, publication. They have the spring 1991, the 1992, and the 2000 issues of that up for download on their website and other information about where this project stands today. And uh, the, uh, it, it, it's interesting when you compile all of the different maps of what they want to do with this, you know, in the Florida panhandle and over here in the in the Rockies and over here in the, in the plains and all of this. And when you compile that into the Wildlands Project map, it is quite startling to see here are the no-go zones, and this little bit over here is where you can live. Um, and this is the, uh, again, this is the ultimate agenda. This isn't just about the aborigines of Palawan Island or 
other uh, people out in the woods somewhere. This is about everyone, everywhere, including Americans and Japanese and Canadians and Australians and Europeans and everyone are going to be increasingly rounded up into increasingly more compact cities where absolutely every aspect of your daily life will be utterly surveilled, monitored, tracked, controlled, and rationed. But don't take my word for it. Take the wet dreams of these would-be social engineers that continue to be foisted on the public as if they're a good thing or something to look forward to. Oh, hi. I'm so glad you're on time. I'm V. I'm looking forward to showing you around Plandopolis today. My husband works from home. He's a virtual engineer working on one of the city's desalination plants. He controls the robots who do all the important maintenance. I think he basically plays computer games for a living. <laughs> you ready to go? Have you got your calorie card open on your smartphone? I registered your visit with Slick Travel Corp the other day, so they've uh, allotted you a journey time to, to match mine. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? Switch off brain and go to work. <laughs> with this many people around, I'm glad there's a mega computer in charge. We're so lucky. Uh, our kids were allocated a school quite near my practice so I can drop them off on the way. It saves on our calorie ration. Well, it won't be long until the little darlings get their career announcements. They've been working so hard, so I'm sure they'll get something good. Not, not that there's anything wrong with fixing carbon scrubbers for a living or anything. Are you hungry? Let's pop to the market as we're passing. Right, what's on the menu this month? No, not meat. It's not your birthday. The Global Food Council are doing a really good job of keeping food production going. I mean, you don't get the choice you used to, but we're better off than most. I think it's probably easiest to walk from here. You barely see a car in the city centre nowadays, unless you're rich. <laughs> well, the state knows they just aren't practical anymore. We're all trying to meet our global carbon deal. Electric bikes are so much better for getting around our neighbourhood. And why waste valuable space on car parks when you can use them to grow food? I don't care what you say, Alex. They don't deserve to live in that ghetto. They are completely disconnected. No high-speed transport system, no new internet. They miss out on jobs and many essential services too. Oh, <laughs> hi again. <laughs> what a day. I had to make a, an emergency visit to the Cry Freedom Ghettos. I mean, I miss my sister like mad, but I'm glad they went when they moved to New Amsterdam. They're safe from climate change on the floating city. <laughs> that must be her now. It's much easier to meet up with friends virtually now. So many cities have banned cars in central areas. Ooh, looks like she's got some juicy gossip. So this was on wefforum.org. That's the Davos site, the Davos elite. And it was written by Ida Aachen, a member of parliament in Denmark. And I checked, and as far as I could find, she hasn't been to Bilderberg or anything like that. But again, she's a member of the Davos elite. We are 7 billion people now on the planet. We're going up to 9 billion. Think about 3 billion people entering the middle class, all wanting cars, mobile phones, computers, eating meat. I mean, this is a huge pressure on the resources we have. But she appears to be what very much what I assume would be a Bernie Sanders style socialist. But she's also hoping that people in the near future will own nothing. That's their big answer to income inequality. They've been talking about it at these conferences for years. They've been talking about universal income, what to do when people can't work. And their answer is people of the future will own nothing. The Davos elite preparing for their annual confab next month have acknowledged the growing problem of the underman who's threatened by the rising cost of living, discouraged by the lack of better paying opportunities overall, and all the other factors that go into living in the society that we've been in. And the answer of the 1% and those even fewer who could be counted among the billionaires of the planet who own more than anyone else listed in the phone book, and their answer is that we should own nothing at all. And we talked a lot about the smart city, how much that's being used for control, but this goes beyond anything. It's straight into Marxist serfdom. Actually, without the problem of work and without the problem of the working man's struggle. So it's neo-feudalism, but with a new twist. 
here's how it goes. Here's what Ida Aachen wrote in her column for Davos. Welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city. Or should I say, our city. I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. I sound like I'm from a Dr. Seuss novel. It might seem odd to you, but it makes perfect sense for us in this city. Everything you considered a product has now become a service. We have access to transportation, accommodation, food, and all the things we need in our daily lives. One by one, these things became free, so it ended up not making sense for us to own much anymore. Why, why do you want to own your cell phone? I mean, you want, the, you want the function, you want the service, right? Why do you want to own a cell phone if you can just lease it? And if you lease, why, why shouldn't you lease your refrigerator or your washing machine or your dishwasher or why do you want to own it? I mean, it's not like the plastic in the middle. It's like, you, I own a, a broke dishwasher. I mean, wow. People don't own cars anymore. There's driverless vehicles and flying cars for longer journeys. I think we've had that one promised before. So why don't you want to go into a business model where the company owns it? Ida Aachen writes that in 2030 in our city, we don't pay any rent because someone else is using our free space whenever we don't need it. Someone else is sleeping in your living room when you're not around or cooking in your kitchen when you're done making dinner. She writes, my living room is being used for business meetings when I'm not there. And once in a while, I will choose to cook for myself. It's easy. Even the necessary kitchen equipment isn't owned. It's delivered to the door by drones within minutes. Environmental problems seem so far away, she says, because of course, it can never really be that far away from Agenda 21. She writes, the air is clean, the water is clean, and nobody would dare touch the protected areas of nature because they constitute such value to our well-being. No one is allowed to go into the wilderness, but in the cities, there's plenty of green space and plants and trees all over. This is sustainable development, and this is where it is being led by the international organizations, led by the same globalist crony insiders that have been pushing global geopolitics for decades, if not centuries. And it's all laid out in the documents. It's all there. It's just a question of putting it together and realizing the staggering scale of what is being proposed, the swindle that is being achieved. Now, there are a lot of details to get into about how this is being done, and we have to start talking about the global cities concept, and we have to start talking about ICLEI, I-C-L-E-I, and organizations like this, how it is going to be done through regional and municipal bodies, not more so than it is through the UN itself, which is going to be an overseer of these types of programs, but it's not going to get its snoot too far into it because people would reject that. Or if it was the national government of any particular uh, nation, nation it, would be, it would be resisted. But if it's done at a local level and if it's done under the cloak of these different terms, it can be, well, it can be very um, uh, insidious. It's a very insidious way of cloaking and masking what is really happening. And it's incumbent on all of us to get read up and understand these things. And to that end, I will encourage you wholeheartedly to go and check the, the documents that will be in the show notes for this episode of the podcast so you can find out more about these, this agenda and how it is unfolding. And the fact that it can, not only can be, but is actively being resisted and effectively so at the local level where it is being foisted upon us. There's no place like Kodiak. Traditional, self-reliant, natural, and free. But even Alaska is not immune to the whims of corrupt officials. As the long arm of one particular program, Agenda 21, started reaching around the country, a local resident, Jamie Fagan, knew he had to do something. Kodiak was his home. He had read Rosa Corey's book, Agenda 21, Behind the Green Mask, and invited her to give a talk in Kodiak. Many people came to listen and understood what she had to say. The event was rather timely. Soon after, the people of Kodiak, with the sharp eye of local resident Kyle Crow, started finding out about a brand new zoning code about to impact the island. They found the revisions horrific. 
The revisions incorporated many of the suggestions of the United Nations' 1992 Agenda 21 Treaty, including making it easier for local officials to seize private property. It would tell them how to live, who to sell to, and how to operate their businesses. It would also impose steep fines of up to $1,000 per day for violations. Refusal to pay for over 30 days would allow borough officials to confiscate property. The nearly 340 pages of new laws were virtually unreadable. Jamie reached out to the Solutions Institute. Rose's talk had shown the people of Kodiak what they were up against. The Solutions Institute helped show them what they could do. They got to work. The Solutions Institute helped them choose a name, set up a Facebook group, and create videos. Grassroots Kodiak volunteers put information about the proposed zoning changes and what was at stake on postcards and mailed them to all 5,500 addresses in Kodiak. It was a call to action. When the borough assembly met in February 2015, activists were ready. Amidst a wet night with flooded roads, more than 300 of the 13,000 people in Kodiak attended. There were 69 speeches in all. The activists were proud of their town, but the people didn't prevail that night. The borough assembly showed no sign of abandoning their plans, and that meant one thing. There was more work to do. Grassroots Kodiak kept up the pressure, and when the matter came to a vote on March 12, 2015, they won. The council voted unanimously to scrap the code inspired by Agenda 21. This agenda can be defeated, it can be brought down, but only if we are aware of the agenda and aware of the things that are taking place at the local level each and every day, let alone these national and global plans. This is where the rubber meets the road, and this is why they are attempting to implement it in little things that will slip your attention. Oh, the local city council just passed this thing, and oh, now we're part of this uh, smart, strong cities network, and all of these very, again, very insidious ways of getting people on board with an agenda that they may not even understand is happening, let alone understand why it needs to be resisted, which is why you are the resistance if you are getting this message and if you understand what is at stake here. This is why you need to be part of the process of informing others and getting them motivated to fight this agenda. So, again, lots of documents and links in the show notes for you to get started in your research on this. And as you see, I think you understand how, again, this this part, the sustainable development, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, global goals, fits in with the whole picture that's being painted here of eugenics and climate change and technocracy. They all swirl around and they're all painted in wonderful terms that it's saving you, it's helping you, it's for the earth, it's for whatever, it's for the best of humanity. And it's always about controlling you and trying to get you out and the globalist cronies in. Uh, competition is a sin, right, J.D. Rockefeller? So, as I say, there's uh, plenty more to be said about a lot of the different concepts that were developed in Why Big Oil Conquered the World, and we'll be doing so in this podcast in the coming weeks. I hope you will be here to join me for that. Once again, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Available now from CorbettReport.com. Oil. The 19th century was transformed by it. The 20th century was shaped by it. And the 21st century is moving beyond it. But who gave birth to the oil industry? And what are they planning to do with that power in a post-carbon world? Heirs to an oil fortune join the divestment drive. There is a price to carbon in their future. The negative impact of population growth. That is important not only for the planet, it is important for the business. What do you see as the biggest challenges in, in conservation? Yeah, the, the growing human population. How and why Big Oil Conquered the World. Watch the documentary for free or purchase a DVD copy at CorbettReport.com slash Big Oil.